Okay, you guys, good news. We're on Facebook and YouTube. So <laughs> Woo! thanks to everybody. We had a little bit of a bump. We've been, we haven't been streaming for about a month. So I'm so glad to be back with um, these two talking about DNA. And Rhett just gave the statement of the year, which is Family Search is an education destination for DNA. And we work with and partner with fantastic resources like Diane. So I think for the first little bit today, we'll talk about DNA basics. And then if you have questions, you know, please pop them in the comments and we will respond to them. But um, why is there a huge, why is DNA so popular now? Like, you know, it seems like everyone, you know, is like, this is the best gift. It's exciting. Yeah. Tell us why. Either one of you, you can well, jump in. <laughs> from my perspective. Well, Rhett, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts. Why do you think? Yeah. Well, yeah, I would just say that every time I turn on the TV, I see a DNA test commercial. Yes. It is all over the media. And those commercials are full of heartwarming messages of discovering who I am, discovering my family, making those connections. And I think that message resonates with people. Yes. Um, each one of us wants to know who we are and we want to know where we come from. And uh, DNA is a way for us to do that. And that message is really just stressed in the messaging, the marketing of these companies. So I think that's probably one of the reasons. Um, and Diane, Diane. I would like your thoughts. Well, no, I think you're totally right. And I, what's so exciting to me is that for how many eons, honestly, hundreds of years have genealogists been trying to get their family interested? Isn't this one of the biggest problems we have is that we feel passionate about this industry of genealogy, mm -hmm. but like we're the only ones or a lot of times we're <laughs> one in our whole family, right? Yes. And it gets hard. Like nobody wants to talk about it. Like, nobody oh wants no, to talk I don't want to wanna hear. Mm -hmm. Yes, but DNA, Everyone's everybody wants it. to talk about DNA. Yes. And that's the thing. I feel like it's this wonderful, bright, interesting entry point. I call it, I call DNA testing a gateway drug, <gasps> you know, yes, mm -hmm. is like mm -hmm. the gateway drug that gets you into the real drug of family history, which mm -hmm. once you're hooked, well, I mean, forget all other hobbies, right? <laughs> so it, it's like, it, it's done something that we haven't been able to do. Mm -hmm. It has captured an entirely new audience and hit that, like Rhett saying that it resonates. Everyone wants to know who they are. Everyone. But before family history didn't seem like a viable way to figure it out. And now it does. And that is so exciting. And oh, I, yes. I think it's a really easy entry point. I mean, yes. you, you take a cheap swab or you spit in a tube and you started your family history. Six yes. or eight weeks later, you're going to get uh, a lot Something. of information. Yeah. If you think of all the, um, like the, like you said, commercials, there's lots of media that talks about it. And so it solves mysteries. Okay. So let's dive into just getting a little bit more understanding of DNA basics. What is, um, one of the most commonly asked questions, Diane, that you get from people who have just gotten their DNA results back? Almost every time, hands down, it's about the ethnicity results because that's what most people are interested in. Because like Rhett said, it's the easiest entry point to learn about who you are. So it's this beautiful map and there's all these percentages. And so they dive in and then a lot of times they A, don't really know what it means and B, sometimes they see things that don't look right. Mm -hmm. um, they, they're missing percentages or there's percentages from places they don't recognize. And so there's all of these different questions that they have about, is this accurate? Does this really mean that I'm from this place? And lots and lots of questions about ethnicity. Mm -hmm. And why, why is it that the ethnicity can vary according to the DNA company? Yeah. So it's really interesting, actually. There's a lot of reasons, but you can kind of boil them down to three different things. So mm -hmm. first of all, it's reference populations. Okay. So reference it's, populations. Who is, the po who is the population that the company is comparing you against? Okay. So Wendy, if you're from some outer Mongolia place, okay, and the testing company hasn't tested anyone from outer Mongolia, well, they're not going to be able to tell you you're from outer Mongolia. So they're going to tell you you're from somewhere else and that won't be right. Okay. They okay. don't, unfortunately, they don't have a category that says, oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Mystery. They're, 
they're not very good at that. They're good at, well, mostly you look like this. And so okay. they might put you in a really big category like Northern European or something. Uh, but still, it requires a population of people that you come from to have been residing in their reference population for you to be from there. So that's the biggest thing, really, because all of our companies have different reference populations. And, and, and I just want to drop and um, jump in and say that um, familysearch.org slash DNA is the education resources. And Diane, you have tons of resources available. So any of these things that you're talking about, there is places to go to learn more. Where would we send people, Diane, um, to your website? What would it be? Yeah, you- let me. Yeah, so it's, I actually made a little slide to help us. Um, oh. Let me just throw it up here really quick so I that you guys can see it. We're going to get a lot of questions about that. So I want to make sure people know that, that we will include that information. Okay. While Diane okay. is pulling that up, it oh. site is phenomenal. It is so easy to understand. So thank you. Your DNA guide. So thank you. Um, and then if you do slash family search, there'll be some really, there's some, a, a free download. A free download. So one of the other big questions, like once you start getting into your research, so you asked, what's the first thing people ask? It's ethnicity. What's down the line, the most I get asked is like, okay, well, I found my DNA match list and I'm excited about it, but I'm writing to people and they won't write me back. Like I want to learn about them, but they don't write me back. And so I wrote this little guide. It's called talk to your DNA matches like a first date. Oh, okay. yes. So you gotta go in easy. Yes. You've got to like, <laughs> uh, you don't talk about yourself on the first date ever, right? right? It's questions. always about them, right? Yes. So yes. if you want to learn a little bit more about how to do that, that's, that's our free download. Okay. Today. This so. is so great. Um, and I did, they were getting a lot of questions, which is really, really exciting. Um, okay. So you said there were three reasons ethnicity changes. Okay. So I so reference population. That's mm-hmm. okay. Fancy math is what I call the second one. This okay. is really complicated math. This is not one plus one equals two. Oh. And so it's, it's like, it's actually, um, the analogy I use, it's like the weather. So when the weatherman predicts the weather, do we expect him to be right? Well, usually, no, no, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's very and that's because it's very complicated. And it's the kind of math that's used to predict the weather that mm-hmm. is the same as the kind of math we use to predict ethnicity. Okay. So we don't, we shouldn't expect it to be like right on because that's like the math is incapable of doing that actually. So this it's really interesting. So, and, and I think what's so interesting too, and I'm excited for you guys to talk about is the science that is behind this, um, which I think makes it so complex and seem mysterious. Okay. So yeah. that's the second reason. That's second. <laughs> the third reason is timing. 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 Yeah. So if you look at your ethnicity results and they say you're from Sweden, mm-hmm. the next question is then when, when uh, are you from Sweden? Yeah. How far back? Right. How far back? And so if it's a place you don't recognize, it could be that that place is so far back in your family history, you may not even find a record that connects you to that place. So they're, they're getting better at helping us with timing as far as communicating that within their website about which places are more recent in our family history and which are more distant. But mm-hmm. still, there's an issue of when. When are you from that place? Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. So ethnicity, thank you. And thank you for talking about that guide and the resources and why people are doing DNA and why it's so popular. Um, Rhett, from your perspective, how have you seen DNA play a part in like solving mysteries for people? And is this a thing? Well, it is a thing. So we host a space at Roots Tech each year called the DNA Basics Learning Center. And that is a, a question that we get all the time. I I have questions that I want answered. And I think a lot of times people think the DNA is that magic bolt that's gonna get them that answer. And it it can be a tool, uh, excuse me, it can be a tool Mm -hmm. that gets us there, but we've got to partner with traditional records and uh, and research. But yeah, it definitely can help us to find answers to those questions. And it's Um, kind of, go go ahead, Diane. Oh, I was just going to ask Rhett to tell us about the cool game that they have at the DNA Learning Center that they're turning into a virtual thing, which I'm super excited about. 
So we have two interactive, we call them interactive learning activities. <laughs> They're games, guys. They are games, yeah. Games. <laughs> trying to teach. And we have two of them. I think the one you're referring to, Diane, is our Jelly Jeans experience, mm -hmm. where what we've done is we represent uh, how DNA is passed from generation to generation using colored jelly beans. Mm -hmm. And so each of your eight great grandparents is represented by a solid color of jelly beans. And when they, your great grandparents get married and they decide to have a child, their jelly beans drop down and they combine to form your grandparents. And so you've got a mixture of your great grandparents' colors of jelly beans. And then uh, those drop down and form your parents and then your parent, parents have you. And so the, the activity shows through color jelly beans, how you are, how everyone that comes before you is represented in you. And we do it with tasty uh, jelly beans. So what we'll have with uh, Roots Tech this year, because it's virtual and I can't, um, I can't Be email you jelly beans. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we've come up with another way to make it rewarding and fun for you. So come visit us at the DNA Basics Learning Center at Roots Tech. It's free to register if you haven't already done so, rootstech.org. And uh, yeah, it's a free space and no pressure to buy anything. We're not selling anything, but we're here to teach you. Yes. And, and in a fun way must join us at rootstech.org and Diane, yes. you're going to be there as well. And um, we want to extend an invitation to everybody, um, you guys. And we actually have a question that's kind of related to what you were just talking about. So I'm just going to jump in because that's what I do. Um, I don't know who asked this, but they said they've never done their DNA, but both of their parents have. And they're wondering if they're oversimplifying by assuming that their DNA is a simple merge of their profiles. How would you answer right. that? It's whatever yes. the jelly beans end up becoming. It is, right? It, no, that's totally right in line with what we were just talking about. So mm -hmm. from a genealogy perspective, because you've had both of your parents tested, you are completely irrelevant. <laughs> so I'm sorry to break it to you, but you really are Doesn't just matter. irrelevant. Yeah. You don't matter, okay? If you're going to be doing genetic genealogy research with DNA, you don't ever use yourself if you've got both parents tested. Okay. But, but from an experience standpoint, from an investment in your own experience and your own genealogy, mm -hmm. it's totally worth it to have your own DNA tested. So you can see your jelly bean mix. So you can mm -hmm. see what you got from both of your parents and you can look at those things for yourself. So I think it has value beyond genetic genealogy. It has value for you personally, but if you're going to do research, you just use your parents. Yeah. <laughs> so, can, can I ask a question? Yes, okay. of the person or okay. of, of <laughs> so, <laughs> one of the common questions that we get is who should I have tested? Oh, mm -hmm. what you brought up makes me think that this is a good time to answer, ask that question. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm no, that's a, yeah, that's a perfect question. So essentially the rule of thumb is if someone does not have both parents available to test, they should test themselves. Ah, okay. That's, it. that's a good tip. Is there That's any it. logic for testing the oldest living generation? Well, yeah, right? Because they would be the generation that doesn't have both parents tested. And okay. so you definitely always want the oldest generation to test and as many as possible. So if your parent has passed away, do they still have siblings? Then you'd want to test them before you test you. So even if both of your parents have passed away, if there are still people alive on their generation, you would test them before you would test you. So how can siblings be different? Um, we have Sarah, why is her DNA report different? And I think let's give a concise answer to that. And you may have already answered it, but. So I'll just. Is it the jelly beans? Go for it. Yeah, I'll do it. Right. Jelly beans. So if, so we know we get 50% uh, of our DNA from mom, 50% from our dad. And so we're a mix of, of all of that. So if you picture a big bucket of jelly beans and I reach in and I grab a handful of jelly beans and my sister reaches in and grabs a handful of jelly beans though we're getting the jelly beans from the same bucket her handful is going to be different from my handful um so we're both getting that 50 percent from each parent but the 50 percent i get from my parents is different from the 50 percent that she gets from mom and 50 percent that she gets from dad so there's going to be overlap but there are differences okay you guys this is great but they're just jumping in we're kind of going all over the place but to remind people participating um there'll be links in the chat and um, there's education pages that we're talking about that I think diving in, you can get 
lots more um, information. And so we're thrilled to have Rhett from Family Search and Diane here as a special guest talking about DNA. Explain the different types of DNA tests. And like, there's words like, I can't even remember, but there's different types of <laughs> DNA. Autosomal something, something, yeah. something. <laughs> right, right. Okay, so there's three kinds of DNA tests okay. for family history. So you've got Y DNA, which traces only your direct male line and only men can test because only men have the Y DNA. Okay, you've got mitochondrial DNA, which is like its complement. So Y traces direct male line, mitochondrial traces direct female line. So all siblings have the same mitochondrial DNA they got from their mother. And then only the females, only the girls pass it on to the next generation. So Y DNA, mitochondrial DNA, kind of the bookends of our family history tree. And then autosomal DNA covers everything in the middle. So the you middle. get, as Rhett said, half from mom, half from dad. So autosomal DNA will represent your family tree all, all over. Okay, quick question from Lucille about autosomal DNA. Can it verify a common great grandfather if you come from one wife and another person comes from another wife or would it need to be the Y DNA test? No, for sure. Autosomal. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Because yes, the difference, feel. Lucille, is either you're not related, right? You don't share the same guy mm -hmm. or you're related in the right way. So if this guy is your shared great grandfather, but you don't share great grandmothers, mm -hmm. are you ready for your relationship? You are half second cousins half second cousins wow okay so i actually just posted a little bit ago on my instagram mm -hmm. a whole explanation about removed and half cousins okay. so if you want a refresher you can go to my instagram but yeah you'll be half second cousins and that's a very specific very measurable kind of relationship with dna so either you won't be related because he's not the guy or you'll be related because you're half second cousins or you'll be related in a different way, which would also tell us something about your relationship. Okay. Oh, you guys, this is great. We're getting a ton more questions. So I'm just gonna going to, um, you know, we're appreciating our viewers participating and they all have questions. And then if there's things that we forget, we'll make sure and come back to. Um, someone, Kathy is asking, she has a lock of her, I think it's her father's um, hair and he passed away a while ago. Can that be tested? Can she do DNA on something like that? The short answer is no. Okay. <laughs> Dang it. So it's, you can do genetic genealogy DNA tests on living individuals. Right. Okay. Okay. And there's more to that story, but we're not going to get but, into it right yep. now. <laughs> this isn't our area of expertise. Okay. How, um, okay. So then this is something that I think people talk a lot about is they think that they have a certain type of indigenous ancestry and then they get tested and they've been told in their family, oh, you're, you know, certain percentage of this tribe or this group. And then the DNA tests do not prove that. Does that have to do with the reference population or what is that? How, how do you, sorry, I'm restating the question. Family legend versus the DNA accuracy. What's the gap about? Yeah, so if you're looking at reference populations, you're right to think that's the first place you should check. Mm -hmm. Again, there, there aren't huge reference populations for Native American people in, our, in, our, in any testing company. So that's number one. Number two is how far back is the ancestor? So for autosomal DNA, it has a cap. Like you probably don't wanna look for anyone further back than your three times great grandparent. And even that is kind of a stretch, okay? okay? So if your native ancestor is your three times or four times great grandparent, the chances that you're going to have enough DNA from that person to be detected and they would have had to have been full-blooded, you know, it's, it's pretty variable. My advice is always to turn to Y or mitochondrial DNA testing. Okay. So Y and mitochondrial don't have that cap of three times greats. Mm -hmm. Okay. They go back and back and back and back. So if the ancestor that you think is native was a woman, you need a direct maternal line descendant. You need her daughter's 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 daughter to take a mitochondrial DNA test. 
This is also, I've got some stories, I guess it's on Facebook and Instagram actually, mm -hmm. but I've got some past posts about Native American testing back from November. Okay. So essentially there are very specific Native American Y and mitochondrial groups. So okay. if you're in one of those, you're in like Flynn, then that person was Native American at some point in that direct line. But if you're not, well, it means the direct maternal line wasn't. That's okay. all you can really tell. You can't say, no, they weren't, but you can say, yes, they were. So, it, at, you know, as people are making the decision of which test or which company to do, they need to look at what they're trying to learn or discover, reference population timing and, and not a cap. Sure. This was a cap. All super great information. This is why um, we have you two on here talking about uh, learning about DNA basics. And we're going to have a whole section at Roots Tech for everyone to participate in that I think we mentioned that. A question we get a lot of um, is, is this idea of how far back, and I know you've talked about the three generations, but how far back is DNA useful? Um, how far back can we go? Yeah, so it's really, I feel like it's really three times great grandparents. Right now, that's all. Do you see Unless that? Unless you're doing wire you mitochondrial. Uh, okay. Yeah, I do actually. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're at the very beginning of this still, mm -hmm. and there's so much more we can learn, and there's so much more technology to be developed. I think yes, we'll be able to get beyond that eventually, so now, if not soon. For now, for now, when you're doing it, think about that three generations reference point. These things are all um, very important. Okay, what about? And I feel like we had this question because Diane, we had you on Instagram, and it was so fascinating. We had to do this again with Rhett, and Rhett, you can jump in here too as well. <laughs> yeah, feel free. Um, people always ask about like identical twins or triplets, or you know, is the DNA going to be completely the same? Yeah, I mean, yes, with a little asterisk. Oh, there yes. are about that. there are differences measurable genetic differences between twins, but they probably will not be picked up in this kind of test. So mm -hmm. they will be the same. And I think what we talked about that's the most important thing about this is mm -hmm. that if you're looking for an ancestor who may have been a twin, you need to think about your DNA matches differently because descendants of a twin, like, so if you have, if you have um, two cousins, first cousins, and they're descendants of sisters that are twins. Okay. Those kids will look like half siblings. <gasps> oh yeah. They're first cousins, but they're going to look like half siblings. So it, it throws off your analysis completely. If you don't know about something like that in your ancestral path. How interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, how, how, like we talked about like people wanting to understand their identity, to solve mysteries, the different types of DNA, a little bit about, you know, kind of the different relationships that it shows up. Why do things change over time? Why do the results change? And I, you may have spoken to this, but I think this is a, a question as someone who's done their DNA and I'll get like an email and it will say, Oh, log in to see, tell us what the reason is for that. Yeah. So I tested, uh, in 2016 and, um, I got an email from the company in 2018 and my results had changed. And then I got another email February of last year that they had changed again. And, uh, Diane talked about fancy math and reference panels and as those reference panels grow and as we refine that fancy math results are going to become more specific and they're going to become more accurate uh, and so you'll see those changes there what's interesting for me when I look at my results from 2018 versus now um, they're more specific but if I add up the categories that have now been split out it equals what it did before it's just more regionalized okay so it's just more people are getting tested the reference panels yeah. Okay. Um, we have, uh, what about how people have been using DNA um, tests to connect living family and that whole piece of it? Do you want to tell us anything about that? And it seems like it's been used to solve mysteries and, and there's maybe that's part of the glamorous piece of DNA, but let's speak to how DNA can connect you with maybe family you didn't know you had. And then maybe a little bit about some of these mysteries. Um, who wants to take that one first? 
Okay, Diane. <laughs> um, okay, so yes, I think this is adding to the glamour, as you said, mm -hmm. um, uh, and the appeal. And I've talked to people who are disappointed that they didn't mm -hmm. find out anything unusual. And most of the time I just say, just wait. <laughs> oh, just because wait. it it seems like many, if not most people that I talk to eventually come across something and it's not their dad or their grandfather, but you get back to a two times or great grandparent. There's a lot of people involved in that relationship. And there's certainly chance for things that you didn't know or understand before. Mm -hmm. um, but I think more what you're talking about is more recent family. And I've talked with lots of people. I do what we call mentoring where I get online with people and we go over their DNA test results and I tell them how to go about solving their mystery. And I've been online several times, like live with someone and I've had to tell them, hey, your, your dad that you grew up with is not the dad that's showing up in your DNA. Oh. And it's a really hard conversation to have. And, you know, we're both kind of being put on the spot and it's hard. And I, I really highly, highly recommend that anybody that is taking a DNA test, you have to understand this is a possibility. Mm -hmm. You will find out things about your relationships that you didn't know before. And you need to be prepared. And especially if you're asking other people to test who aren't interested, it's mm -hmm. really important that you let them know. You don't have to say, hey, if I find your missing dad, do you want me to tell you? I mean, you don't have to like scare them or anything, but at least say, hey, there's a chance we could find stuff that we don't know. Do you want me to tell you about it or not? Mm -hmm. so that you know in advance what to do, because that's a big problem. So many of us genealogists are getting our family members tested, then something comes up and we don't know what to do. Like it's not our family, even it's their family. Mm -hmm. And now we have to navigate a situation for our cousin and it gets really complicated. Mm -hmm. So kind of upfront having that conversation in advance is really valuable. Oh, that is a great recommendation. And um, I appreciate that. Setting, yeah. setting those sort of expectations that there may yeah. be a surprise. And if there is a surprise, how do you want to, you know, handle it? Um, mm -hmm. Rhett, what do you think about the mysteries and the things that happen with DNA? And have you had an experience connecting to family that you didn't know through DNA? No, I haven't. And so I'm, I, I don't know that I'm saying I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> but you're ready. But I'm ready. Yeah. Um, and I need to better prepare my family that because of what I do for a living, I am the de facto genealogist of the family. And um, um, so yeah, having those conversations in advance, letting them know that, hey, there may be some family secrets out there that we need to be prepared to at least recognize. So. To recognize and talk about. Yeah. And it seems like there's um, like, so I think a relative race, a BYU TV yeah. show. Yeah, yeah. Do mm -hmm. a lot of DNA kind of reveals. And so how, how is it that, um, you know, I think one of the appeals is, can you find, you know, family that you didn't know you had, how common is that? Is it, and what's the most common relationship? I know for mine, it's like fourth cousin. Um, but when people do do their DNA with uh, some of these bigger companies, they're shown people they could be related to. What does that experience look like? And how have you seen that be a benefit? Well, so I think the biggest benefit that I think people need to be taking away from this kind of unexpected relationship situation is to recognize that at one point, all of our ancestors were 19 year old girls and boys, mm. and they <laughs> had real lives and they acted and talked and behaved like a teenager. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think that when we see our grandma, I've had so many people say, oh, my grandma would never do that. Well, it's because you knew your grandma when she was 70, right? you know, and it's just, it's such a wonderful thing to expand your perspective about the people in your life. Mm -hmm. And that in turn helps you expand your perspective about yourself, yes. you know, and think, oh my gosh, good. I'm not always going to be like this. I can grow up. I can mature. I can overcome things that I, that mistakes that I've made. Mm -hmm. I mean, surely if you, you look at your grandmother and she gave up a baby when she was 17, like 
that's a hard thing to go through. And you think the reason she is the person she is, is because she went through that. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm going through something hard, I can think, you know what? Grandma did that and she made it and she made a successful life and family. And I can do that too. And I just think people miss that. They, they are quick to judge and, and quick to cause cast blame. And we just need to be more open-minded about ourselves and about our family. Mm -hmm. I, we could end right now with that mic drop <laughs> moment, Diane. I agree. And I love that you said, here's an opportunity to understand somebody differently and go into it with respect and grace and um, curiosity, right? Yes, curiosity. Shame mm -hmm. and judgment. And um, okay, so we've got a couple more questions. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Rhett? I was just going to say that um, what we've seen from grandmother's life and the wonderful life she's made that stuff is all part of us as well. Grandma's DNA is passed to us. And her strength, I'm, I grew up with my grandma and I learned a lot from her. And not only do I carry her DNA, I carry all the lessons that she passed on to me. And if she, if she, there was something she'd done in her past, it's not gonna change my perception of my grandmother. She is a, just an incredible woman, both of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yes, yes. I mean, we all are a mix of everything we've done and experienced. And if we didn't make mistakes, we wouldn't be exactly. these awesome people we are right now. Right. Totally. <laughs> I make tons of mistakes today. <laughs> As all the time. Okay. Um, this is a question from Dorothy and I'm just going to read it. So I'm not, um, yeah. It says, we are looking for my brother's father. He has done the ancestry test. It shows almost all of my mom's side. How do I know if the people on his close match DNA list are actually related through his biological dad? Do you follow okay. that? Okay. Yeah, totally. Okay. All right. Dorothy, Dorothy. We're here for you. <laughs> okay, Dorothy. The best tool in genetic genealogy is the shared matches tool. It is magical. Okay, so whatever company you're at, they have a shared matches tool. So you can see on the on the test, like log in as your brother, right? You see yourself showing up as a half sister. You use the shared matches tool on you and all of those people have to be related to him on your mom's side, on his mom's side, right? So it's like you go through your list, you cross off everybody that shares with you. Anyone that's left over unequivocally that's like a first, second, or third cousin, not everybody, but first, second, or third cousins, okay, are related to his dad. Okay. Everybody. Okay. Okay. If you don't have those closer relationships, no first cousins, no second cousins, no third cousins, then usually what that means is that either A, this dad was from a different planet, mm -hmm. not likely. B, this person was the only child of an only child of an only child of an only child, possible, but still not really yeah. likely. Or three, this person was a recent immigrant to the United States. So these databases are still heavily US based. And mm -hmm. so when I see someone who doesn't have very many matches, oftentimes it's because they're a descendant of a recent immigrant. So that could be a clue. And you can see that in your ethnicity also. Okay. Um, as we are, you know, we've got a few more minutes here. If you have any more specific questions, drop them in the chat for Diane and Rhett. Um, we've talked about, a, I mean, DNA is just a huge, like you talked about growing genetic genealogy is a growing field. And Diane, where do you see genetic genealogy going in the future? Mm -hmm. Like just dream. In yeah. That. Well, it's been like really, we call it this like tipping point happened about mm, 2010, 2011 ish, mm -hmm. when the databases finally autosomal DNA databases finally got big enough to where we were finding matches, so that we could piece together family relationships. And so that has just skyrocketed for people in the US. And that's the problem, right? If you are from a different country, you are kind of back in 2010. You're like 10 years behind the United States because you're getting matches, but there, a lot of them are with people in the US who are your distant cousins. And so what we need are databases around the world to grow. We need international people to grow. And that is going to explode this technology for everyone. And I think that's what we can definitely expect to see happen here 
in the near future even. Okay. I think that's great. Rhett, what, what would your wish be, or what do you think is going to happen with genetic genealogy? I don't know what's going to happen, but my wish would be <laughs> is that I could, from my DNA, just um, have a way to reconstitute my tree just from spitting in a tube. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I honestly think that's not impossible. No, I don't it's think not. It's either. I, 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 like a source. Yeah. Yeah. Like a source. Um, okay. So I would love Diane for you to just tell us a minute about what you're doing at Roots Tech and some of the classes that you're teaching. And then Rhett, would you kind of just give us an overview of some of the classes for people who are wanting to dive deeper into DNA? Because like we talked about at the beginning, this is a huge, you know, industry field. So Diane, take it away. Okay. Yeah. So there's lots of places you can find me at Roots Tech. Uh, so number one is I have two classes in the main Roots Tech lecture series that they have. And you can find those classes just by searching by my name or by searching DNA, honestly. But the two classes I'm teaching are the top questions that I get asked about DNA. So kind of like this, but with actual slides that are beautiful, if I do say so myself. Slides are chatty faces. <laughs> yes. Um, and the second one is four next steps for your DNA test. So I really try to just walk you through what should you be doing next? What's one, two, three, four things that you can do. So those are the two classes. And then Rhett is in charge of the DNA Learning Center, which is in the exhibit hall. And I have three classes that you can take there. And those are like actually on a schedule. So the ones at Roots Tech proper on demand. So you can go and watch them whenever Anything. you want during those three days that Roots Tech is up. The demo booth at um, that Rhett's running is on a schedule. So you have to go check the schedule and see when my classes are. But I also have a booth, your DNA guide has a booth in the exhibit hall. So please come and visit us there. We have coupons yes. and downloads. Oh, so if people, and, okay, this is smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so coupons and downloads and videos and tips, like tips and tricks videos. We've got eight of those, like different, like quick tips mm -hmm. about your DNA test. Plus there's a chat. <sighs> so you can just sit there and talk with me online, like all oh, day. Awesome. Yes, you don't no. have to have Rhett and I in there. No. <laughs> okay. Rhett, tell us about the what you're what what you're going to talk about, and then we have a couple more questions before we wrap up. Okay, so, go ahead, Rhett. So Diane um, introduced it. We've got what's called the DNA Basics Learning Center in the Expo Hall at Roots Tech, uh, and it's a space that's dedicated to those of us who are new to genetic genealogy. We're focusing on those basic questions, such as who do I test? What test should I even take? whether it's autosomal, Y, uh, mitochondrial. Um, I've taken a test, what do I do with my test results? So we'll have those interactive learning activities, the games that we talked about earlier. We will have um, presentations talking about these very basic topics. Um, we've got those scheduled every hour, 24 hours a day through the course of the conference. And Diane mentioned that they are at scheduled times. We'll have a, a posted schedule, but once the presentation presentation is aired, it will be in an on-demand library where you can go watch it anytime. Anytime. So, yeah. Cool. This is great. Mm -hmm. So we're really excited about that. And then in addition to the activities and the presentations, we also have um, knowledgeable people that will be in a chat where you can go ask questions and get help with your basic genetic genealogy question. So if you want some guidance on which test to take or what next steps you should take after testing, come visit us and we'll help you answer those questions. And then drop by Diane's booth and get just a little bit more uh, detail on that. So um, insider so we, tip is take advantage of the chat. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Yeah, so I'll just give a plug for Diane in preparation for Roots Tech. I've been going through all of the DNA videos that have been submitted. And so I've had the privilege of watching Diane's tips and tricks and her two sessions, plus the three classes for the DNA. <laughs> she is an incredible <laughs> presenter. So we should yes. check it out. Thank you. Okay. Okay. You guys, we're going to do a handful, just a few more questions. Um, and thank you to everyone. Um, okay. Betty has a cousin who was recently found out she was adopted and their first cousins, how do I narrow down which cousin was her dad? I'm not sure. Wait, if say that again. Okay, that so again. this is, Betty says she has a cousin who was, who recently found out she was adopted. So okay. maybe adopted. Okay. Yeah, um, we are first cousins. How do I narrow down which cousin was her dad? I'm not sure if you can, but. 
Okay, so genetically, your first cousins with this person that is adopted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So right. So you can't without more DNA testing. Like if if um, so, let's say there are three brothers. Okay. Without more DNA testing, you wouldn't be able to tell which one was the dad. But if a, a child of one of them had tested and that person is still a first cousin, well, it's not him. Mm. Right. So you can, you can okay. kind of parse it out with people that have been tested. You might be able to eliminate people, but in the end, a lot of times that's all you're left with. It could have been one of these two people and yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Steven is saying, and this is, I think more of a clarifying question. The three generation cap for DNA is really for paternal only maternal does not have that cap. Okay. So when you say three generations, what I mean is three times greats. So it's actually five or six generations back. If you're counting from yourself, parent and grandparent. Okay. So that's just for autosomal DNA. Okay. So you think of autosomal DNA is broad and shallow in your tree. Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA are narrow and deep. Mm. <laughs> That's a great reason that the autosomal is only good for those five or so generations is because you're getting half and then it's half. Then you get half of that and half of that. So when you get back uh, five or six generations, it's pretty diluted. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to end with this question from Barry. Um, because I think this is so, and everyone who's watching, thank you for joining us back here on Family Search Live. We won't be here next week, but we will be here, um, and we have some really fun things planned. So we hope that you you will join us. And if you're interested in a specific guest or topic, let us know. Um, but this is going to be our last question, and a super shout out, thank you to our moderators and to our guests, um, Rhett and Diane. So. Barry, can learned. I put up my contact slide again really quick while we're answering the last question? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, Barry says he learned that his dad um, was not his biological father a few years ago. And it's been a challenge with family members, especially for three new half siblings. And the three siblings he grew up with have been tested as half siblings. Any suggestions in helping him um, help his family understand, especially his children and grandchildren? So I think what he's asking is they had a situation like you described, Diane, which was a surprise. And um, it looked like what the relationships they thought they had biologically weren't. And so I suspect there, there was some commotion about that. And now they're trying to say, how do we move forward with this different um, sort of understanding? And right. What, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure we've got your link and everything in the chat, and then I'm gonna go okay. back to our screens because like, this is a great question. Yeah. You want me to stop sharing? There we go. You got it. Um, okay. It's it's tricky. One of the best things that I've I've learned because um, my mom was adopted as well, and so we've navigated similar situations. Um, We were the ones, you know, explaining to half siblings who we were and and it's difficult. There's no question. Uh, I think number one is it's important to remember that DNA does not reign supreme. And what I mean by that is as DNA is gained in popularity, we tend to think of it as the ultimate measure of our relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's not. A family is not made by DNA. Family is made by love, by relationships, by experience, by time. Okay. So, so you, you don't lose anything when you gain a biological relationship. So that's the first thing to understand or to try to understand. Um, The second thing is this is hard and it's okay to feel like this is hard. Mm -hmm. It's okay to take a while to reel and to just try and ground yourself. Don't expect to just take it in stride. Like this is a really hard thing to go through. No question. Next is you personally have a right to understand your heritage. You have a right to know your ancestors, but you don't have a right to relationships. Hmm. So if you have a biological relationship that you've discovered, but that person is not ready to accept you, that's their choice. Mm -hmm. And you have to be okay with that. And you shouldn't be 
angry or upset because that doesn't do you any good. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to recognize family history is important. You have a right to that information, but you don't have a right to relationships. And I think the best choice for children moving forward is to be totally upfront and say, this is, these people are all our family. Aren't we lucky? Aren't you lucky that you have two grandpas or three grandpas instead of just two other kids have two grandpas. You have three. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that just the way society is now, a lot of people have three or four grandpas. And so it's not that unusual to be a kid in this kind of situation, but to, to not be ashamed and to, to own it and to accept all of the people that our ancestors were. Yes. Oh, I, Diane, that's powerful. And Barry, thank you for asking that question. And I think regardless of what you learned from DNA or otherwise, accept all the people that our ancestors were. Rhett, um, did you want to add anything to Barry's question? I I would would just say be be sensitive to the, Mm -hmm. the situation. And Diane said, you don't have a right to that relationship and be sensitive to that other person's needs. They, this may be, it is most likely something that is a pretty sensitive, maybe even a painful part of their past mm-hmm. and they may come around, they may not, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. Okay. What a wonderful conversation with the, the two of you and with our guests. And um, as we wrap up, Diane, what would you like to say to everybody watching? I mean, I feel like we've just like, we've got them all excited and now it's like, now what? <laughs> um, my, my now what is that I really hundred percent believe you can do the DNA. That is like our logo, our tagline of our business. Like if you want to, you can learn how. So don't shy away from science. Don't think that you can't because you never liked science before. It doesn't matter. Your past relationship with science has nothing to do with your future relationship with DNA. You can do this. You can can learn. You can. That's my message. Oh, I love that. Rhett, what about you? I've learned that from personal experience. (laughs) I am not a scientist, but I have learned and I'm still learning and um, learning how to apply these things. Uh, what I would just say is that during Roots Tech, I'm going to plug that again. Um, a lot of these DNA testing companies are represented and oftentimes they offer discounts on their test kits. So if you are thinking about testing, come visit us and um, most likely you'll find some good deals on these tests. So yeah, for sure they will. Org, register. Huh? Discover your DNA if you haven't yet at Roots Tech and so much more um, with all of the classes. Thank you, Rhett. Thank you, Diane. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate it. My pleasure.